G'day, everyone, and for those who came in late, you're listening to X Men the Phantom Podcast. Years ago, he washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck, and upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice, and cruelty, and all my sons will follow me, so evildoers will believe that this man cannot die. The Phantom! The ghost who walks! The Phantom! Enemies beware! The Phantom's always there, but you won't find the Phantom. Hello, we are the Chronicle Chamber team, and this is x the Phantom Podcast. Our website is chroniclechamber.com, and you can contact us via email, chroniclechamber at gmail.com. Uh, you can subscribe to us via YouTube or through any of your favourite podcast apps. Wherever you're listening to this from, I'm sure you can hit the subscribe button and, uh, and hear us every time we uh, send one up. Um, my name's Dan Fraser, and uh, the whole team is back together tonight. Uh, Germ, thanks for uh, putting up with our absence over the last little while. Good to uh, good to see you. Yeah, it's been a while since we've all been together. Um, a couple of episodes, and we've had uh, a couple of fill-in episodes. Um, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Kahn and um, oh, Maria uh, with their panel, and, and then um, myself and Duncan. And so, yeah, it's been a couple of episodes, so it's good to have us all back again. Absolutely, and uh, we're joined also by Stephen. How are you, Stephen? Oh, we're a happy team at Hawthorne. <laughs> where I know it alienates some of the audience. They don't know about Aussie Rules footy, but for those of you who don't know, my team, the Hawthorne Hawks, won today. They're a young team. They're up and coming, and uh, we beat our old nemesis, Geelong. So any Geelong fans out there, happy Easter Monday to you all. It's <laughs> one. There we are. I've got to have a system. I'll take my hat off now, and uh, let's talk <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, Steve. I, I appreciate how subtle you are, mate. Um, it's really <laughs> anyway, we're on. Uh, we're in Team Chronicle Chamber, as <laughs> as we've said um, all along. And uh, this is episode two hundred and seventeen. Or did I say that earlier about this being our April twenty twenty two comics and news podcast? Um, a little bit croaky in the throat. Sorry, guys. It's been a big Easter Monday um, as well. So, um, how have you been, guys, over the last little while? Anyway, Jim. Yeah, look, um, it's good to have a, or well, hopefully this will be a shorter um, comics and news podcast. We've had some lengthy ones the last couple of uh, episodes, so looking forward to this. Uh, really enjoyed the stories that we're, um, we're going to discuss as well. So, um, yeah, we, sh- we should have some fun, I reckon. Yep, all right. Now, oh, we didn't discuss, but I assume, Jim, you're ready to go with digital copies of everything, so I'll wave a few things in front of the camera, and then I'm sure at the right time you'll, you'll bring up digitals of whatever mm. we're talking about. Should we talk about the covers first, and um, and then and then maybe the paper quality, and then we can kind of go into the story. You reckon? All right, sounds good. So um, obviously, uh, well, but you probably have figured out if you're a true fan of fan, and why else wouldn't you be if you if you're listening to us? Uh, that we're going to start by talking about through publications and the uh, the latest issues from those guys, um, and very neatly for us and uh, the April Comics and News, it is a three part story that has been re- released in three consecutive comics. And uh, we've all read the whole story and be able to talk about Death in the East End, parts one, two, and three, uh, through 19, 14, 15, and 16. Um, so straight up, guys, um, we, Jim mentioned the covers, and we need to give them dil- due diligence first. And so uh, cover one uh, by Glenn Lumsden here, holding that one up. Thoughts on up this one? Um, this is probably my favourite out of the three covers. No disrespect to Jason or Jamie. Um, but I just I love the phantom in the background, the raining, the, the the dark feel, the and I really enjoy this main villain, Madam X. We'll get that set in the story, but she is a great character, um, and I just I just love the way like she's depicted on here. Like you don't know who she is. She's in shadow. She's you know in the wheelchair, but that doesn't mean she's not dangerous, as you can see with the gun um, and. You know, and then even on the back cover, you've got the bad guy, you know, uh, sneaking behind the big grandfather clock. It's just, it's, uh, yeah, and I love like the, like the oranges and and stuff like that, which kind of adds some brightness to the to the darkness of the cover as well. So I just, yeah, I really like his cover. Um, yeah, when I when I heard when I heard that we're getting these stories, even though I've already got the stories, I was excited because these are good story so yeah really excited about reviewing these 
I thought that um, Glenn's clever really set the tone for the for the story. Mm. It's dark, it's menacing, it's um, very mysterious. Like you don't see who who the female character is, very much in shadow, but the phantom stalking in the background, ready, you know, coming for her. And um, but she's a a foe you've got to watch out for. She's sneaky, she's crafty, and she's got a hidden pistol that you really got to watch out for. And um, yeah, so I, I thought seeing that on, on the on the shelf. I think that's a fantastic way to start off. Um, Jason Paulos, um, it, well, it was another Jason uh, cover. It looks, it's definitely his style. You know who it is straight away. It kind of looks like the fella's smiling that, <laughs> that, he, that the yeah. fan is hitting there. Um, that would probably be my critique on that. Um, otherwise, it, it's action-packed. It, and it's, I think, all three, if I'm just have a quick look, I think they're all wraparounds. Um yeah. All fall along. Um, but yeah, this one's action packed, and you see the mysterious in Jason's on the back cover. Um, uh, the mysterious lady again gets a, a feature in a door. This time she's not in the wheelchair, so we've seen a plot development mm. there. And with, Jamie. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, sorry, with Jason's covers, majority of his, well, not majority, but a lot of his cover, covers are the, the 20 guys against the Phantom. Um, yeah, certainly he's used it before, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the odds are stacked up against him. Yeah, yeah, and it's and, and uh, that's one of the things that I like about the covers is that you know you, you know you're going to get twenty bad guys trying to fight this one guy, and um, yeah, I, th I think he's done a great job with that. Well, and that's why there's so much uh, the, the feel of so much action on the cover because there's mm. action coming from everywhere. So, mm. yeah, and and with Jamie's, it um, I don't think it sums up the it's a good conclusion to the to the three parter in that. Very subtly, the the mysterious woman's in there again, but this time she's revealed. So in the other two, she's still in darkness, and now she's revealed in the, in the third part, and you, and you know who it is. Um, a different style to the other two. Still, once again, if you saw that up on the um, on the shelf, it sings out. You think that's a, a quality looking mm. um, uh, cover. To to me, it, it harkens back, and I and I'm not. I reckon it's Moonstone. If I'm, I can't remember the artist. Or, um, but that pirate image, or not pirate, but first phantom image, um, where he's holding the skull. I think it's a moonstone cover. I should have a look for it. But um, it, for some reason, it, it reminds me of that. I'll see if I can find it and um, and I'll show you what I mean. But yeah, I think three quality covers to match with um, a, a, a very quality, good quality story. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, agree. And I, I really like how Jamie's uh, cover, the last one, really, it, it feels like it has that cinema um, movie poster element to it. And so that really brings it to a crescendo. One thing I would add is the um, two images on the back covers that didn't get mentioned. or, or um, So on the back of Jamie, on the, uh, Jamie Johnson's 1916, The Phantom Reading the Chronicles, I really love the lighting and the, the, the juxtaposition of that and, the, and showing us that it's the telling of a story. And the other one, Joe mentioned the bad guy, but one of the, the great features of the back of J Glenn Lumsden's cover for mine is um, the young kid getting dragged away and the way his eyes just pop out of the, uh, pop out of the um, shadows there. And... Um, yeah, that those two eyes just really grabbed me. So great cover from Glenn. Uh, I agree, Jim. It's probably my favourite of the three. But I'd like to see them put together as a, a poster set from Fru. Um, I think the three of them as an A2 poster set would um, would go well. Or maybe a folio. I don't know. There's a supernova coming up. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. We'll get to that in the news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. So what did you guys think about the paper quality? So for those who don't know... Issue one nine one four. Normal. You think he's ignoring the elephant in the room, Jim? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then uh, one nine one five and one nine five six use different paper. Um, and like, this is not going to be very good uh, audio, but like, you, you kind of you get the two comics, so you get you know one nine one four, get one nine one five, kind of flip them together. This comic is very floppy. And this all the one, noise, all the noise you can hear is coming out of 1914, not 1915. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing the different quality of paper. Do you guys like it? Yes, uh, and it's very very noticeable. My um, uh, local comic shop um, owner uh, was very impressed when um, when she picked it up. Oh, what's going on here? And, and flicked it open and, and was really taken aback. Mm. 
What I also like is the crispness of the printing and that you're actually reading on white paper. Mm. And vibrant. Yeah, yeah it, it is. It's very vibrant. Like, um, again, this might not show up the best. Uh, if you're so, if you're on audio, basically what I'm doing is I'm holding up an overlapping of the two comics, um, and it's probably not going to show up the best because you know, let's face it, our video quality on Zoom and and stuff like that's not the best. But do yourself a favor if you've got the comics, open them up uh, next to each other, and it's it's amazing, even like the vibrancy of the white as well. It's just, in my opinion, it, it makes the read a lot nicer. And it almost certainly is going to last longer too, isn't it? Like the the older your Phantom collection, any, any of the comics in your collection, we all know this. No matter how they've been kept, unless they've been in mylar or, or sealed forever and a day, there's a yellowing to them. And the older they get, the yellower they get. These ones would last a lot longer, I'd imagine. Mm. And so it's an extra what? It's an extra 25 cents. Now, would you guys pay an extra 25 cents to have thicker paper? Well, I think we've done that already. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I guess it, Jim's asking if we got a vote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like if you know, if if Fru actually decided that our opinion counts, you know, and they said, would you pay an extra twenty five cents, you know, and to have thicker paper, would you do it? All right, just to just to clarify, and I'm going to quote from Dudley's message from the publisher here. So you're saying twenty five cents? Yes, that's for these thirty six pages. For the 100-page specials, it's going to be $0.50 cents extra, and the annual, which is 212 pages, is an extra dollar. So um, that's not that much. You know, people, how much, do you, how much is a coffee these days, even a coffee at Macca's? I didn't do this, and we should have. We absolutely should have. But um, there is a weight difference as well, and that's, you know, the, obviously the paper is heavier. It'd be interesting to know what the, I don't know, it's going to add up with postage. And a 212-page comic, that uh, those pages are going to get very heavy very quickly. James going to get the scales. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go. He's going to get the scales. Get the scales. <laughs> so let's let's figure this out. So you just keep talking, and I'm going to turn on my scales. Oh, and we'll weigh while he's them. doing that, I found I found the Moonstone that I was thinking of. It was Phantom Generations One. And now that I've looked at it, it's actually very different to that. I think <laughs> it's mainly because it's got the side profile of the Phantom and then you've got these other characters facing forward. I think that was what was reminding me of it. Okay. So uh, issue 1914 was 42 grams. Yep. And issue 1915 was 72 grams. Yeah, see, that's... Oh, that's not, did you say 41 to 72? Yeah. It's getting towards double. What What about yeah. 1916 for quality control? <laughs> quality control. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, what, that doesn't seem <laughs> right. Is it a little bit lighter? It feels a little yeah, bit lighter. Yeah, it me. is a little bit lighter because I'm looking at it's 63 grams. Yeah, to I did. I did to, think that as I was going through, actually, that the that uh, the second of the two, the, the, the it wasn't the same. The middle one, the yeah, I'm not yeah, surprised by those numbers. No, neither am I. So, but you, you you're right. So most people who send free comics out and stuff to you know Indian fans or US fans or and stuff like that, they normally do it by the kilo. So yep. if, you know, a, a kilo of comics, you're probably looking at maybe one or two less, maybe three less if you're doing a kilo. So, yeah, you're right. Maybe, you know, maybe something. Well, no, I'm, I'm probably thinking more from Fru's end. Like, they've got yeah. the postage every parcel, not just by the kilo to a friend in India, but um, to every subscriber. Uh, well, I kind of feel a bit guilty, reckon- actually, to be honest, because, you know, you've said, uh, did we pay an extra 25 cents? I didn't because my subscription um, renewed about a month before this happened. So <laughs> I've got them at the same price and I'm guaranteed it's going to be costing through extra. Um, no, postage will be the same or because postage is done by, I think it's, is it 250 or 150 grams? But I, the point, the point that we're making is that there could be a difference in, uh, in costs, subscription costs as well. Yeah, I oh, no, absolutely. You would yeah. expect it to, to go up by at least the same proportion. Um, I think the main difference would be in regards to the weight will be um, 
the the annual if they're going to be using this quality um, mm. paper. Yeah. I know it's been mentioned in the past um, when they send things out that they've had to limit the number of pages. It's no longer 300. It's down to, what, 212 if we're lucky. Um, and that's because of the weight in, in the yep with a lot of the things so this might have something to um might have some effect come around uh come next annual yeah that's a good point the other advantage of the crisper thicker paper is that i reckon color printing will be better as well no we is. have we have talked in the past that sometimes color the colors can be a little bit muddy we talked about it with the moonstone story that was in the annual i reckon that would look a lot better on this paper than uh, you know the normal, the previous type of paper. Yeah, well, it would have to be. Mm. It would have to be. <laughs> and, and and talking about colour, shout out to Ivan for one of the best April Fool's pranks yeah. um, <laughs> that went around. It he certainly got a third of the Chronicle Chamber team, didn't he, Steve? Yep, Germ <laughs> was sucked in hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> that was brilliant. Yeah. All right, should we do the stories now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's have a look at the uh, great thing, story. Steve. Let's just remember, right. you guys are the ones that have said that you just want this to be a short podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's too hot. We won't explore that one anymore. All right, so Death in the East End, it was first published, I think if I remember from Dudley's message from the publisher, 32 years ago. So it is a repeat story and we know uh, that uh, historically we on the podcast have hated repeat stories, but Jim, uh, Dudley's bright, 32 years ago was the last time this bit was in print, um, probably before any of us started collecting the first time in any serious way. So um, it, it certainly felt like a, a fresh new story to me. I hadn't, I didn't feel like I'd read it before particularly. What about you guys? Um, I, I read it and I, I remember the story. I've loved the story. I actually read it not long ago. So for me, it was something that was um, fairly newish because this is a story that I've read continuously. Um, and I'm actually finding it really hard to try and sharing the screen. I'm not sure what is going on at the moment. Well, while well, you um, you look through that, Steve, have you got earlier recollections of Death in the East End? Have you read it before? Um, I don't think so. Um, it wasn't familiar to me. Um, I thought it was, but um, I think that was just the art style. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, and two classic artists we've got as well, um, obviously Georges Bess, uh, did parts one and part two, and then Hans Lindahl, for whatever reason, we don't know, um, took over for part three. Um, and it's interesting to see that change in art style. Um, comments on, well, actually, we won't comment on the art until Steve, until uh, Jim is able to share his screen. <laughs> um, what about the what about the story? So this is um, by Michael Cheres, as he was known on the the YouTube viewers will see that the screen's starting to come up. But uh, Michael Cheris was the um, was the author. This was Clays from Ethy, but before he wanted people to know who he really was, uh, when he was still using his pseudonym. Um, back in 1988 or something, late 80s, it was uh, was written, 87, first published in Scandinavia. Um, thoughts on the story as a whole, Steve? I like the story as a whole. Um, it's... I don't mind historical ones, and uh, when they're done well, they're, they're done really well. Um, the story kicked along well, action packed. There was mystery how they get, you know, how they're going to get through it, all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, um, I, every episode, or I'll say episode or, or parts, nicely wrapped up, um, and the the next episode or the next part um, quickly gives you what a quick recount. It's it's that old. Um, that old way of doing it, um, Rex and was it Toma? Um, yeah. You know, one of the stories from Uncle Walker. And so they go to the Chronicles and and um, that sets up the story and bang, off they go. And, they, and that's the way they start off for uh, episodes one, two and three. I think in part three, the fandom actually says, come on, boys, let's go and read, yeah. the, read the final part. So probably, like, okay, let's get straight into it. Not going to worry about the nagging um Uncle Walker to, to get into it. Um, yeah, full of mystery. Just like the covers suggest, it's full of mystery. Um, the fan to step behind, trying to figure out what's going on. And um, it, obviously in the artwork. They remind me, yeah. It reminds me a lot of like the old uh, like Hardy Boys or the Three Investigator type of stories. I'm not sure if you've read those books when you were yeah. teenagers. 
or uh, young adults where, you know, it's, it's kind of like a bunch of kids solving mysteries. There's, you know, bad guys, there's secret tunnels, there's that mysterious, mm. you know. It's person. got everything that you want. Mm. And and the art with the black and white with George, what George Best uh, George Best does in this is absolutely brilliant. This is this is him at his top of his game, in my opinion. Um, See, I'm, I'm I'm not completely sold, particularly on the in the first one. It just seemed a bit muddled for my for my liking. Really? Yeah, really. I wasn't like I liked it, but it just I don't know. Maybe it's because it was on the the the. The worst paper, the, the lower quality paper. <laughs> but um, the the art, like it's obviously good or great. But um, I just the, there were some instances where I, I didn't like it. Steve so, so, coming out with the controversial opinions, like yeah, well, yeah. And I, I, but I can't yeah. really put my finger on why I don't really like it. If, I, I wish I could. I wish I was more. I knew well, more about art, so I can say I don't like it because of this. But yeah, I, I think, it, yeah. It just seems in, in some places it just seems a little for me muddled is the only word I'm from There's with. not there's not maybe this is what you're talking about, it's but not, it's not, not very well defined, it's clean faces. Big, there's yeah. not big panels either. It's yeah, all I guess. very you know, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, it's it's the seven, eight panels, you know, there's even what there's three you know, there's nine on that one. So there's not much, you know, yeah. there's not the larger panels or the, you know, the big action one pages or anything like that. So I, maybe... I think it was um, the kids, actually. It's, it's that, that was what got me in. I was trying to figure out which kid was who. I, that, that got confusing for me. If I'm, yeah. that's, that's what it was, particularly in part one. It took a couple um, of pages for the kids to um, be, to clearly be a part, I thought. Yeah, I, I was getting confused there. I didn't know who was who. And, and probably if we go back and critique. start again, you'd see it immediately. Yeah, but but reading it fresh and which one's Kit, which one's his mate. Um, yeah, that was that was like it's not a huge critique. Like it's still an awesome story. Um, but yeah, that was that was my issue with it was trying to figure out the kids because when I looked through, I thought, oh no, the the adults' faces are very well defined. Like the, the mm. teacher who's the Crack addict or whatever he was. I um, love some of these action scenes. Yeah. Some of these action scenes are great, and like the angles, like coming from the lady with the gun, and mm. yeah, no, he's. I, I think he's very good. I, I, I wonder, Steve, if if it was in color, would uh, and they were able to more clearly define the panels by color, whether it would be decluttered for you. Um, but by the same token, I don't know if I'd like it in color. Like I think the scarecrow's mm. face, that the teacher's face would look probably um, cartoonish if it was yeah. in colour, whereas it's it, it, it keeps a bit of a misshapen evil about it um, in black and white. I don't know. So you raise a good point about uh, George Bess's artwork in, um, uh, in colour. Uh, Phantom Men have actually, the last year or two, they've released a couple of his stories and they've done them in colour. Um, and Mikkel on some of his reviews have actually has actually commented that he's been surprised at how well it looks because he uses a lot of blacks. Like, you know, some of the panels, again, you see it on YouTube yeah. as we're going through it or if you're flicking through it as, as we're talking, he uses a lot of blacks. But, um, yeah, Mikkel uh, said that he was surprised at how well some of the pages actually uh, turned up in colour. So maybe... You know, maybe um, it, it wouldn't be as bad as what we thought. Just going through them, um, I prefer the artwork in episode three than episodes one and two. So that's that's Hans Lindell. Yeah. Um, so how? Yeah, and then this was early days Hans Lindell as well, where mm. his style has changed. But like some of the yeah, some of the atmosphere say. in this. I must say, I, I thought that Hans and Dahl's Phantom in, in 1960 or Part 3 um, was too bulky, was too Yeah, hefty. I'll, give, I'll um, give you that critique, absolutely. Whereas, whereas he still had that liveness in, uh, in uh, Bess's depiction. Yeah, and we've been quite uh, forthright in our comments that we like a more skinnier, athletic... <laughs> version of of the phantom yeah i like a strong look i like i don't want him too thin i like him you know 
looks like he's strong. He's going to knock you, knock you out with one punch. <laughs> so, what did you think about the character Madame X? So that again, I, oh, Madame I really X. liked her. Yeah, I, I thought that uh, that was well done, and um, even uh, even though. Like there's, there was, it was well done. It was well written in terms of the reveal of the second and then the third um, iteration of um, of her disguise and costuming. So, um, no, I thought she was um, she's up there with Princess Sin for mine in terms of yeah. um, femme fatales across you know in this type of story. Yeah, and she's similar era as well. Like from yeah. the, you know, like the I think Sin was early eighties, maybe late seventies. Where late seventies, I think. Yeah, this is late eighties, but she's. Yeah, she's a gr- she's a great character, and um, yeah, but- she's evil, ruthless, all the things you want in a in a bag, an absolute match, and just absolutely absolutely has this goal and is absolutely set for it, and will not and will yeah will not let anyone get in their way, even if she even if they're on her side. Mm. You and stop look, up, um, you're out. In terms of sequels or prequels, there's certainly opportunities because part three finishes with uh, she disappeared and uh, presumed drowned, but her body was never found. Um, and yeah. there are definitely more Tale of the Red Hand stories in Further Chronicles. So um, there's certainly opportunity for, for someone out there if they want to write a part four of uh, Death in the East End. Did <laughs> Maybe, and look, look, what were your thoughts about this being potentially? Like, to me, this is a gaslight era phantom. Yeah, well, I guess, but you got to remember, it's the same era, but the gaslight is the genre where it's emphasised, yeah. yeah, more on the steampunk. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah. the same era because it's what it's the Seventeenth Phantom, as you can see here yeah. if you're on YouTube. Yeah. Um, so I thought the kid would have been the gaslight phantom. Yeah, 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 you're right, and I think Eighteenth is gaslight phantom in the yeah. uh, in the frame. Uh, no, no, because. Gaslight's yeah, with Julie, isn't isn't that the eighteenth? Am I wrong? I thought Julie was the seventeenth Phantom sister. Well, you would know. <laughs> <laughs> if there's anyone who'd know, Jim, it would be you. <laughs> you've, got, you've got me. You got me questioning myself now, there, mate. But I'm pretty sure it's the seventeenth. There's um, well, people listening to this thing. And, it's a seven. Oh, it's the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you not it, know that? It's one? it's late. I'm absolutely. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm not. I'm not exactly. Um, uh, I was shooting on all cylinders, mate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> let me just quickly do a quick. Um, yeah. Well, while you look that up, and I guess it's pointed because we're talking about the era, and and it's interesting what you said before, Steve, about not necessarily liking historical stories, because I'm I'm probably in I the like same. them. I don't mind them. Well, okay. Well, I'm on the record of not necessarily. What I like about this story is that it's a, a story it set in history. It is the seventeenth. Yeah, I found um, it too. He was right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a story set in a historical time period, but it's not a historical story in that it doesn't claim to change the course of history or have the phantom involved yeah. in that history. And I think those are the stories that get cumbersome. Um, so I think if you just go, right, well, what was um, England like at the time of the 17th phantom? Let's write him a story that's set there, not worrying about political machinations and all the rest of it. Yeah. I yeah. think... Some stories that are based on historical elements are good, but not all of them. And sometimes it just feels like they're trying too hard to shoehorn the Phantom yeah. into that historical moment. And you know, because sometimes, sometimes the stories are great, like um, uh, the King of Norway when uh, Norway became their own, you know, had their own um, their first king. You know, that was a really good story. That fit really well. But then there's some other stories, and it's just that oh, you've tried too hard in this one. Yeah. Um, so. All right. Well, look, um, I think um, not to cut you off, but I feel like we've talked about the death in the East yep. End. You ran around and around. We're starting to get wax lyrical on historical stories now, which I started. And I, that, but let's move on. Um, just, just a quick. Summary at the end, obviously there'll be a, uh, a best of 2022 through um, survey that we put out, uh, which we've done the last few years, and best story is one of the categories. What are your thoughts at, at this early stage of the chances of uh, Death in the East End featuring in your top three, five, ten uh, through stories for the year? I reckon, by the way, oh, I reckon by the way Germ talks, it's already in his top tens. <laughs> <laughs> so I reckon it'll, it'll score highly for him. Would I be right there, Germ? Yeah, top 10 easily. Top five, uh, probably too early to call, but yep. easily in my top 10. 
without even having to think about and having to uh like you know like like just yeah top 10 but you know and that's without me going and looking on wiki to find out what's appeared in four months already yep <laughs> uh, let alone what's what may well be to come um steve what are your thoughts i think it will score high i don't know if i'll if i'll score it high um but it does tick a lot of the, the right boxes and i think fan and fans um We'll enjoy the enjoy the story and, and we'll rank yeah. highly. I do have a critique though. Was the fan having a beer in episode three? I think he did. Yeah. Yeah. Like, after what he's been through, mate, I couldn't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> um, what page was it on? I think you just, I, you I were, you were thinking one. through it just a moment ago. Yeah. 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 On page eight and page nine, it's a beer. He does. He does have the odd beer. Um, Mike Manley draws him having a red wine with his family. Yeah. Um, yeah. Moonstone, <laughs> Moonstone had him with a pink quick. Um, <laughs> it was it was really weird. It was really weird. I call it a pink a, a pink quick, which is like a. I'm sure most people know what strawberry it. flavored milk. Strawberry yeah, flavored. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it was it was in a wine glass. And it was exactly the same as what Diana had. And the, uh, the waiter said, here's your pinra and then here's your milk. But it was pink and it was in the same glass as what Diana was. <laughs> so I think what happened there is the artist drew it and then the editor changed it to milk without redrawing the panel. So, um, Well, look, the colorist didn't read the dialogue particularly yeah. close. <laughs> yeah. Look, I personally think the Phantom should stick to milk. It's – look, it – it's one of those tropes that sets apart the Phantom from a lot of other characters. Yes, I don't think there's anything wrong with the Phantom having a beer or a wine with his family and stuff like that, but it's just one of... It's the same as why the Phantom wears his mask around at home. You know, it's just because we he has to do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I, I think as long as you get the balance right, um, you know... Yeah, I think milk's the go-to, and I think there's um, humorous lines that can come from that and that sort of thing, but I guess the story's got a um, call for that at the time as well, and um, sometimes he doesn't want to stand out. He just wants to be an ordinary man when he's at the bar <laughs> trying to gather information, and you don't always do that by buying milk. So <laughs> anyway, um, look, I, I would say that um, at this early stage, Death in the East End probably is going to be in my top 10, and I, and I take the covers into account when I think about that because as a package of covers, um, those those three really enhance the story, I thought, um, and, and as a narrative that bounces along well, um, and it, as Steve said, is sort of wrapped up in each issue but also make sure you want to read the next issue to find out what's happening next in the story yeah. um i thought it was really well done and the art was 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 brilliant so yeah quite likely going to be in my top 10 um and uh looking forward to seeing what might beat it out uh much like we enjoy uh seeing goal of the year or mark of the year early in the piece going i hope something else can uh, can trump that because it's going to be pretty spectacular but uh Anyway, that's uh, that's through 19, 14, 15, and 16, Death in the East End. Um, what we get, well, those are, that's are the only through comics that have been out so far. So we're going to hand over to our um, foreign correspondents or international correspondents, I should say, uh, because the fan of his international, of course. Um, Mikkel from uh, Sweden is going to talk to us about Phantomen and Ankit from India about Shakti. Looking forward to hearing about these issues, guys. Welcome for another Fantoma review by me, Mikael. This is issue 8 of 2022 with this cool cover by Henrik Saltström with the twins swimming around in the flooded city. The main and only Phantom story in this issue is the flooded city and it is, as we guessed by the cover, the latest part of the 22nd Phantom arc. We learn from the editorial page that this and the next issue features the last two stories written by Klaus Remerti. So that is quite sad. Uh, we also read about uh, action figures. This time it's a fan-made one made by Anders Eklund. And it looks uh, a bit like the Dynamite's Lost Phantom with the blood running here, in my opinion. Uh, so, back to the Flooded City. It has art by Genius Ornan. The story has two parallel storylines. Uh, the twins is trying to take down the vultures that plan on, yeah, you guessed it, to flood a city. 
and Diana is uh, trying to get her original report to the right persons while getting chased by an assassin. Lots of action as usual with the 22nd Phantom and I liked it a lot. Phantom's art is magnificent as always. And uh, the issue also contains a side comic, Thorgal, and a lot of Phantom fans probably ranks this as their favorite side comic. It has been missing quite a while from Phantom, and this is, I believe, the 37th album. It is about uh, Viking, but with fantasy elements, and some part even has sci-fi, but this one has not. It was quite okay. Better than many of the other later ones in the series. And in the preview of the next issue, we get to see another part of the 22nd Phantom arc that we talked about earlier. And the conclusion of the Thorgal album. So looking forward for that in two weeks. This time it is issue 9 of 2022. Heloise is on the cover by Henrik Salström. So I'm excited, but also a bit sad to read the... Last new Remerti Phantom story ever. The story, Showdown at Paradise Hotel. Not sure if it's intended, but it's a bit funny in Sweden since we have a reality show here called Paradise Hotel, but I'm quite sure it's not the same hotel. As the last issue, uh, the art is done by Janus Orden, and it is great as always. And the last time it ended with a bit of a cliffhanger, and this issue ties together the plot lines. But even if they are not tied together, it's not really tied up. So this story arc needs to be continued to be concluded. And my hope is that Andreas and Jakob are planning to do that. The second part of the issue is uh, Torgal, and that's the second part of the album that started last issue. Uh, then we have some editorial page, or one editorial page. Andreas writes a bit about class last issue. Some memorials about Iron Kennedy and some opinions about the new Red Piraten, the Red Pirate side comic. Then next time we're gonna have three newspaper stories. It is uh, Tony De Paul, Jeff Weigel, Phantom Rock, it is the Twins Birthday, Cyberry and Lee Falkton and the uh, reunion Tony DePaul and Mike Manley. So that will be lots of Phantom. But this excites me even more. So this is Carl Schempe as a side comic. Everyone who has backed my card game probably knows that I really like his comic. And I even mentioned it a few times. He also runs Kickstarter to fund the Carl Schempe comic book. And I think this one will suit Phantom and greatly since... It's also an adventure story. It tells the story about this this Carl, he, who is a Karolian, who that is a Swedish soldier during the shift of the 16th and 17th century. But he's fighting more than people. He's fighting all kinds of demons and monsters that comes in his way. I recommend everyone to check it out. Uh, there is even a free digital version of his comic in English, and I hope we put it in the description below. And just see some other comics he has. The art is quite cool and yeah, I think it will be a great fit and I think this is great. So thank you for me and happy phantoming. Hello and welcome to another Chronicle Chamber book review. I'm Ankit and today I'll be reviewing Shakti Comics from India's The Phantom issue number 3. And now before we begin, uh, one thing we have to realize is Shakti uh, takes these books out in uh, two more languages that is of uh, Bengali and Hindi. However, I don't have those issues with them. So I'll be only reviewing the English one. They are basically the same. It's just a different language. Everything else, the design and all is the same. So yeah, first of the things that you can notice is that they have changed the kind of presentation uh, from the previous few issues. You can see it was... Uh, the artwork in this issue one and two the art was uh, throughout the book while now they have this white strip at the top like a header with all the details and they've also started adding the issue numbers and the name of the story being printed uh, in the issue itself on the top of the cover so yeah 
the cover uh, art is uh, drawn by me and colored by Abhishek Biswas so yeah and uh, the story featured is a detective with crime which is by Tony DePaul and the art inside is by uh, Paul Ryan and uh, going through the book you, uh, one of the, another interesting thing in the design is they have put the credits in Hindi English and Bengali in all the books it's very thing and it also seems like they will be going ahead with this because this design is now consistent among the other two books they release at the same time which is Mandrake and Flash Gordon and uh, so yeah so this seems like uh, a new uh, design decision that they have taken and maybe we can see it keep going and it and maybe and i i kind of like it because it gives a very unique look to their product and so it kind of stands out like you know it's it's very it will become very instantly recognizable and especially with the fact that you know the story name and the issue is uh, clearly highlighted oh, another thing is they actually have an ad at the back of the book which is like something very new instead of their own ads which they are inside so yeah so the story is uh a detective with crime which is by Tony DePaul and uh, art by Paul Ryan so as many those who know this is a daily story and it's it's a very uh, unique one and also this story uh, uh, follows up in two more stories I guess which I think they will be printing in the subsequent uh, issues so it's it will be like a long running storyline that way across uh, two more issues or or whatever considering the characters involved i think there are four stories which uh, actually involve the characters introduced here so yeah everything else is usual great quality it's a very good faithful reproduction of uh, the actual daily stories and they are in the standard four uh, panel a page format and it's tight and yeah it's very usual now this book has was uh, solicited for march but it has delayed to about uh, april and all that's because the uttar pradesh elections were going on and uh, so there was like the printers and all were definitely like uh, burdened with a lot of work and another thing is the since now they are printing the stories uh, in like one story per book and this is a relatively uh, standard so this book is like about 36 pages yeah and yeah so that's about it uh, i look forward to the, the next few releases because i think the storyline will go through them so yeah that's about it happy phantoming all right thanks very much guys much more succinct, succinct than we are as usual and far less likely to uh, to go on uh, random tangents um coming out of hearing about comics from around the world though we want to hear about the uh the daily and the sunday stories the newspaper strips uh, whether you see them in your local newspaper or catch up with snippets on Facebook or uh, comicskingdom.com, I'm sure should have been the first thing that I said. Um, but anyway, um, let's talk about the uh, the current Sunday first because I'm, I'm keen, I'm very keen to hook into the daily. Um, but uh, let's talk about the current Sunday for the moment. We understand that there's three weeks to go in this story. Uh, the Ingenue, uh, Sunday uh, 192. Um, thoughts on the last month, guys, um, as we've seen, as we've seen the Maury girls, um, wander uh, mindlessly through a, a nightclub, get saved, but unbeknownst to them, um, thoughts on how this is unfolding. I've enjoyed the story. Um, today's, uh, have you got today's jam? Uh, yeah, well, yesterday's. I oh, was today, Monday. Yeah. You're so, the one going on about it being Monday at the start. <laughs> Sorry, I should have said this week. <laughs> um, and the girls talking about um, how the boys, they've become men because they've been able to do what they've been able to do. And they feel like they've been able to accomplish things as well. But have they really without the Phantom being there? That's what I was going to say. Is like I understand the concept of this story well i think i understand the concept of this story and tony will correct me if i'm wrong that that these girls have become women you know being able to you know do life without and you know they talk about it here you know no parents no elders just us but it almost feels like they haven't because they've got the phantom looking over their shoulder so 
Um, I I think I understand where you're coming from, Stephen, and I think yeah. I agree with you. I, I would like to see in next week that they they do something spectacular, well, not spectacular, but something that really gives them that change between girl and, and woman. Like, yes, they've, yeah. they've gone to the city and they've been, and for the most part, you know, they, they've gone out and experienced something new and they've come back with this new appreciation for their home, for their, for their home, um, which, which is also great. Um, I'd like to see this fellow you got up there, the big boss. I want to see his, him get his comeuppance. Um, that would be great. So if the girls could just, you know, knock him out, that would be awesome. And, well, maybe um, if the girls the expose up. him and, yeah. and, you know, um, like he, they are influential in making him get arrested or, or something like that. But it, it's so far, and I don't want to sound too negative because I understand a lot of people have enjoyed this story, but so far... I have. All, I've enjoyed the story. It's all going according to script and... I would, you know, uh, Jeff Weigel, uh, Jeff on Facebook said, you know, last Sunday that there's three Sundays to go. So I wonder if that's enough for, you know, maybe for these girls to, I don't know, the, the guy stalking, they beat the, you know, the snot out of him and then help him get arrested or something like that. You know, like that, I don't know, is that going to prove them that they're, you know, that they can do life without their parents or their elders, or is that just, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think three weeks would be good. That'd be just enough time, I reckon, because it mm. sounds like, well, th- this panel that we've got up here, it wraps it up and you could, you could end it there. Yeah. Um, so with three more weeks, you could really add a bit more story. The, the week before, prior, I'm about to try and click on the button, I love that <laughs> line in the second last box. Um, detectives will know you by the by that was it identifying mark in your face. <laughs> what mark? What are you talking about? I thought that was just brilliant. That was bad. yeah. And then this bit here where you know, knock on the window. It's <laughs> like, hold on. Out yeah. it's rough on rough head. next. It was uh, yeah. It's it's missing yeah. that um, it's missing yeah. It's missing that uh, old jungle saying. It just would have been perfect there. What about so, you, Dan? No, I agree with uh, agree with everything you've said there, guys. Um, it is um, it, it is an interesting side by side tale of the boys going off, and I know you know that well. We haven't followed them on this occasion, but we know from in the past it's a it's a long, arduous canoe. It's 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 exhausting. You're against the elements. You're facing hardship. You're testing yourself. And um, the point that you guys have raised is uh, is exactly right. That these Maori girls, other than sleeping in the park and no one noticing that they turn up to the nightclubs looking homeless because they've been <laughs> sleeping in the park. Um, you know, they haven't really experienced hardship as such. Um, three, three Sundays isn't enough to do the, the plot narrative that you've described, which I think would be sensational. It's, it, three seems too short, but three is also too long for, you know, something's got to happen in the next, in the, in the next 27 panels sort of thing. So, um, yeah, they're not just going to wander home and be welcomed back at the tribe either. You wouldn't have thought. So it's interesting. It's, uh, to see where it goes. Also with the, with the, the, the boys or the men on their trip, the fan was with them on, on that boat, boat trip yeah. too. Yeah. But it was only with, so, only, only, on one, though, only on one boat. Yeah. He, he didn't stay, did he? No, no, he stayed because so this was the voyage of the sea or, or something. It was about... In a different story. In this story, he didn't go yeah. the whole time with the boys. No. Uh, but when we first saw it... So Tony DePaul's written a story on the voyage or the manhood trip with them. And from memory, what had happened was... They got separated. He was with the prince, who's now the king, and there was a family that was kidnapped. Uh, I think the boy jumped over over the ocean or something like that. They rescued the boy, and then they diverted off course to rescue the family, and then that was kind of like the point. The, the, the prince was proven that he's the right person to you know, become the next leader and and stuff like that. Um, I can't remember. At the top of my head, I can't remember the, t- the titles or anything, but um, I will quickly mm-hmm. shoot on to Fan and Wiki, and I'm sure – I think it was a Paul Ryan story, actually. All right. Well, um, yeah, look, it, it'll just be interesting. I'm sure, and, and we know because he, he actually comments on our YouTube videos, uh, we know that Tony DePaul – 
uh, watches and listens to these. And so I'm sure he's uh, <laughs> having an absolute giggle of a time listening to us try and speculate how this might wrap up in the time frame. And, he's and just shaking we, his head. <laughs> yeah, you've sure. got no idea, guys. It's taking you no. three podcasts to learn how to say the title of the, the <laughs> You've got no idea. What, We're always uh, wrong when it comes noticed, to whatever yeah. it is doing. <laughs> We're I've always wrong. I noticed Stephen hasn't tried to say the title again. Um, <laughs> I, so, I, I think that's the third time I've said it today, isn't it? Um, so the the com- the story that we were just talking about was uh, daily number two twenty, and it was called the Voyaging Canoe. It was uh, in newspapers in two thousand and seven, so that's fourteen years ago or 15, 14, 15 years ago, and it was by Tony DePaul and Paul Ryan. Yeah, very good. And uh, published in Fru. Uh, published in Fru. Where are we? So published in Fru in one four nine six, which was in 20, 000, uh, 2008. Um, hasn't been published in India yet. Um, oh, actually, no. Sorry, it has. It's in some of the um, Euro books. That was published in twenty eleven. And then it was published in Sweden. Hasn't been published in Sweden. Oh, no. Uh, Sweden in 2009, issue 15, 20, uh, 2009. And it's okay. also been published in Turkey as well. And I think that um, speaking of the way it's been published um, all together, by the time we get the ingenue in a in a through comic book, um, I think it's going to be a really fun well-paced story. Um, I th- I've enjoyed reading it a week at a time, but I also think it's going to stand up really well, being able to just flick through it um, in, in a comic book style. So anyway, it remains to be seen okay. how it wraps up. And next time there's a comic news, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll be able to um, play this back and, and see how we went. <laughs> so quick question. When Fruit publish it, should they publish Voyaging of the Canoe at the same time? Oh, that'd be a nice double, wouldn't it? Yeah, good idea. It's going to cost us what, an extra 50 15, cents. It'll be 15 years between the previous the previous publication, which is... I'd like it if they did, because I don't think I've read The, the Voyage of Canoe. Mm. And, and it'd be a great juxtaposition for them. I think uh, you absolutely need to write uh, the Phantom Forum a letter, Jim. <laughs> or Dudley. I know you listen to this, so you can just... <laughs> oh, just I think he's got better things to do. I don't know how Dudley <laughs> all this I know Dudley doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we move on to Death in the Himalayas? Absolutely. So Death in the Himalayas is actually wrapped up. So we're just talking about um, the Sunday wrapping up by the time we have our next comics and news. The the Daily actually has, in so much as we seem to have come to the end of a chapter, um, and I guess it's been a bit of a discussion about this series of stories um, that have had uh, uh, started with um, oh, Trail of Gravelines was the, was the name of it, I suspect. Um, and, yeah, and-, and then we had the Old Man Moz's. Chronicle, and then we've got the death in death in the Himalayas. And, and as we record on Easter Monday, the start of the next chapter, Phantom's End, sounds like it could be the concluding chapter. Um, it sounds quite ominous, but I'll, we'll get to that, I suppose, as we unpack Death in the Himalayas. Um, so it, it really has been um, an extension of um, of Moz's um, foretelling or soothsaying. Um, you get the feeling that we're right now at the end of that and now we're going to go into what's actually going to happen. This has all been prediction and and fantasy, so to speak, so far. Um, Look, there's some great panels in here by um, Mike Manley. Mike Manley, he's done a great job with some of his, um, uh, some of the work on here. Um, We left off when the Phantom and his Tudor was starting to defend the city. Um, but yeah, there's just some great uh great panels. His kit saving his life. Um and then then you have this bit, which was I think this kind of came out around the same time as um uh the war in Ukraine started. So and for the audio oh for the audio we're looking at uh the 21st of March, uh, March, March, uh, which has got some big bomb bomber planes and stuff like that. So it happened around the same time, which was uh, one of those things. And then you've got the bombs getting dropped onto the city. And Kabe- uh, how do you say his name? Is it 
Kabaya Do, Do, Kabaya Do. Oh, I have good for me. Um, uh, gets bombed. I have G Do. And pass away. So um, yeah, it's 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 quite a graphic vocal or graphic violent story. Um, but I, I've kind of liked the adultness of it. And lots of it being told, speaking to Manly's art, as you were, like um, a lot of it being told with the art too, not a lot of dialogue required as you go through a lot of those sequences you've just shown us. Yeah, and that's where Mike's good at, like, like you know, look, the fandom doesn't show much facial expressions at the best of the time, but being able to show emotion with a couple of lines and no words, it's 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 a it's a great skill. Mm. Um, yeah, he really has depicted emotion in that with with just the simple side on profile. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, I mean, he's, uh, also an excellent job. And mm. then and just even with his like mannerisms, like with his hands on his hips and um, and the way he's kind of looking, in, you know, it, it's amazing. Not many artists could do could show as much emotion on the Phantom as what Mike can, and I think he's done a great job. Um, this this little bit here in the story where he's talking about how Kit becomes a, a what would you call it, a, a commander a gorilla. Yeah, it's kind of, um, it, it's, and then, we, and then we talk about what happened with, um, with Heloise and all that. Like, what are you guys thought about that? I was going to ask you the same thing. Like, it's pretty dramatic what uh, what Moz is foretelling, that neither Kit nor Heloise want to take on the family name. Um, Kit goes on to be, I guess, without an oath, like the Phantom without an oath, in that he's well, just a... a to be ben- honest, he becomes, he becomes a terrorist. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I'm not mincing words, he becomes a terrorist. He becomes everything that, and the Phantom talks about it later on, but he becomes everything that the Phantom doesn't stand, you know, it's not. Mm, mm. And uh, and Heloise just walking away from the from the family altogether. Yeah. So um, it's gonna. Well, you don't like Moz as a as a foreteller and a soothsayer. Um, no. This may prove that he's got no idea what he's talking about. The whole story was Moz's imagination and um, we had bad pizza. <laughs> he had, <laughs> he'd had some bad pizza. <laughs> So, uh, should, have, should, have, should have put that pizza in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting, it's an interesting narrative well that uh, Tony DePaul has dug, and it's going to be really interesting to see to see what he pulls out of it in Phantom's End. It's it, as I said, it's an ominous, ominous sort of a name for the next story. We we see that um, at the end as well of of, um, of uh, this one, Death in the Himalayas, that basically the Phantom has. Uh, told Diana enough of the story that she says, "No, you absolutely must go and save her." He doesn't. He certainly doesn't go into all the details that Moz gave him before he uh, looks like he's about to charge off and, and, and embark on trying to save Savannah from Gravelines Prison. Which, to be honest, we all thought we saw at the start of months and months and months ago. So. Yeah, no, um, I didn't. No, he's, <laughs> he's done the old husband trick of um, just telling the wife just enough. <laughs> Yeah. It's just missing out a key detail. <laughs> and hopefully it doesn't come back to bite you in the bum. Yeah. Uh, of course it will. <laughs> um, look, I'm not really sure that um, where, where Diana says, where does she say this? Um, she'll be safe here with us here in the deep woods. I'm not sure if that's something you really want. Like we, well, maybe Diana doesn't know, but Savannah's got a huge torch for the Phantom. Do you really want a rival living next door in the deep woods with you? I'm not sure if that's something, you know. Uh, harken, harkens back to the Sala days, doesn't it? Yeah, or well, maybe the next maybe the next story is going to be called Sister Wives. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have greater faith in Kim Walker than you do. <laughs> um, look, it's going to be interesting where this goes. Um I know a few, few people saw this, the, and we're looking at uh, the 16th of April, uh, you know, where it's got next Phantom's End, and a few people have kind of go, oh, you know, is this going to be the end? And I saw one person say, it's not going to be the end because if it was going to be the end of the Phantom, they would do 
what they did with the wedding and do the same story over both episodes. Now, I know it's not going to be the end because of everything that Tony D. Paul has said on the podcast or on on YouTube. If you and oh, the, I would the fact recommend that Jeff Weigel posts uh, little snippets and saying coming up in September. That's helpful. <laughs> <as well. laughs> but I would recommend everyone who who who's intrigued by this to go back and listen to what was it, episode two hundred six A or or something like that or something along there where. Tony DePaul spends a good half hour to an hour talking about this story, about the end of The Phantom, and then he talks, he always comments on the YouTube uh, channel as well, and he gives great yeah. insight as well. So I would recommend everyone having a read of those as well, especially if, if this has kind of got your interest about The Phantom's End. Are you talking about episode 200, the, the, the one where Jeff, Tony, and Mike were on together? Yeah, but there was, a, there was an excerpt that I cut out. So it was 190, 196A is what you're thinking of. Okay, 196A. So go back and listen the to that. 20, that's a, it's 17 minutes. It's, it's uh, a nice little snippet. Yeah, that will be one of our shortest podcasts ever. Ever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of which, this was going to be a short one, and yet uh, uh, here we are. <laughs> um, right, not, in Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that was my job at the start, and I'm the one leading the side tracks. So, so anyway. where do you? All right. So quickly, in one or two <laughs> minutes, where do you think? What do you think the Phantom's End is going to be about? Or where, what are we going to see next? Ah. Uh, I don't know is the short answer, German. It's kind of delightful to to not know. Like, I, other than knowing that everything's going to be all right at the end um, and it's not going to be the death of the 21st man, and we know this. So um, so with that in mind, I'm really open-minded and I'm looking forward to seeing. And, and I'm, you know, not every oh, – Tony is good at making every title mean something, actually, when you think over the, the titles of his story. So it'll mean something, but um, – God. Yeah, I, I must admit, I'm at loss of what to expect as well. Um, and then, okay, quickly. Now, if you were in the Phantom's shoes, would you go rescue Savannah or would you leave her there to rot? Uh, I think, I think uh, if no, I'm the Phantom who's sworn that oath and I'm the Phantom, then yeah, I go to, to rescue Savannah. Um, even, I think if that's part means, of even if it means your kids and the. Basically, the end of the Phantom line ends. Oh, look, with you. We, we, we've been around Old Moz for a long time. We know he enjoys leaving, eating his pizza after it's been left out overnight. Doesn't, <laughs> mind, doesn't mind. He's prone to saying, telling you lots of stories, and there's always a bit of mayo on it. So I'm sure you'd go, right, Old Moz. I appreciate that. I'll take it carefully. Um, I'll probably, I'll, I'll try not to go to the vets where I lose my mind and, and speak randomly. So, um, that'll be the that'll be the lesson I take out of it if I'm the fan. Don't go to the van. Steve, <laughs> anything to add? Go, go to the Himalayas first, pick up Kit, and the two of them go and rescue Savannah. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. It's not a bad so, idea. So to change it up, whatever Moz has said, don't do what Moz has said. Go yeah. do something else. Yep. <sighs> so well, if you're on social media, if you're on YouTube, <laughs> make sure you leave us your thoughts. Uh, we want to know what you think. We want to know what you would do. Uh, would you rescue Savannah or would you let her leave her to rot? Um, or would you bring her back and do Sister Wives? What's your uh, answer? I, to be... Look, it, it is a hard one because you're right. If you swore the oath, you have to do what's right. It's your mandate. But there'll be a part of you... But can you really play, can you really play God as well? Like, and... You know, like say, I'm not going to rescue her because you, you have to go rescue her. But I think, I think Steve's right. I think you would go. Um, I like the idea of getting Kit because that throws that whole concept all out. You know, there's two That's people. Yeah, you know, and maybe, maybe this is Kit's test in a sense. We all love the the the, the story where the Phantom has to go through a test to see if he's. And Heloise has had hers with the nomad. Yeah. Mm. So maybe, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe you throw it all out of whack, all of old man Moz's um, of vision, and, um, yeah, and you take it. 
Yeah. Cool. If that's the story we're about to see, I look forward to it. If it's not, I'll look forward to it anyway. So um, <laughs> good work, Steve. You can write the alternative ending if it doesn't go the way you've you about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get into the, the news portion of the program. And um, we'll start with uh, uh, something that you've been working really hard on, German. And uh, I must be the, I'll be the first to put my hand up and say I haven't really had anything other than trying to win prizes. I've had nothing to do with this. Um, but the, the, the work that, I guess, was initiated, that was started or, or suggested by Sal Valuto, he came to, came to us and you've really jumped on board with it and uh, getting involved in, in using the, the reach of the Chronicle Chamber and the generosity of phantom artists um, and creators around the world uh, to raise some money for uh, UNICEF in particular to support uh, uh, children in Ukraine, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Now, i got a theory the reason why you're distancing yourself is so that way there's a little bit of... Um uh, distance, so you can actually try and win a faffle. Um, um, well, I've got to get one of them one of these days. <laughs> I keep entering. <laughs> but um, yeah, look, the, we've I think so far we've raised close to seven hundred dollars uh, for uh, UNICEF. Um, we've got some more to come uh, as this comes out. There will be uh, one for Charles. I recorded a video with him this morning. Um, he's a a comic book artist who basically has been following our um, our videos on YouTube and then he saw Sal's video and he was um, very touched with it and he wanted to do something. Um, so he, he's, done a, he's done a drawing for that. So that will come up for, that's up for Faffle at the moment. Uh, Sal has been touched with what we've done so far. So he's actually uh, brought along another piece, which was... Uh, penciled and coloured by him and inked by another phantom artist, another Italian who's done some moonstone work as well. So there'll be some more of that coming soon as well. Uh, Lennart Moberg, who was a guest, uh, Steve, you and I interviewed him a couple of years ago. He's got a, he's got a couple of pieces, I believe. So depending on what they are, they're on their way to me. Uh, we might do another faffle and we might we're trying to look at different different options. We may even look at doing maybe like a live auction or something like that, see if that works. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Antonio Lemus uh, is in the middle of doing a piece as well. Um, I was actually talking to another creator who was talking to Antonio Lemus and they said that he spent a good week really trying to come up with a piece and, trying to come up with a meaning behind it and a story behind it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this piece. Um, and we'll probably, we'll do a video with Antonio as well on that. So, mm. so yeah. So, look, I, if I had an aim, I would like to see at least $2,500 donated through this little platform to UNICEF. So we're about 700 at the moment. I reckon we could get there. Um, but that's kind of like the goal that, I've kind of got. Yep. No, that that's awesome, German. Uh, the the effort you're putting into it. Um, anyone who's um, in, in keen, make sure that you're following us on Facebook because that's where you we're running it all through. Um, so go jump on Facebook if you're not following us yet. ChronicleChamber.com. Uh, search for us and, and you'll find us there, and you'll be able to see the videos that German's been putting up um, of uh, of the faffles as they go. You can jump on board there. Uh, all, you, all you do is comment on the on the post and um, book yourself a. A spot. There's always the information's there on how to, to buy a ticket in the in the raffles, the faffles, uh, and and ra- just raise that money for a really important cause. Uh, so thanks for your work there, uh, Germ. And, um, and thank you, to the creators, and thank you to everyone who's already donated yeah. or entered the faffles. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So All right. hang on, while we're, while we're doing it, let's quickly let's quickly give everyone a shout out who has donated or brought a piece. So I'm just going to go to the page. So. Um, where are we? So, uh, Daniel Brogner, Michael Cavanaugh, uh, Trevor Clark, Sean Bassett, Robert Cheek, Bradley Peach, Tim Duffy, Swarup Chand, uh, Pete Gooselink, uh, Dan Fraser, uh, Nick Moles, uh, Sanctum Books, uh, Chris Walker. And no, that is not 
the Phantom. It is actually someone called Chris Walker. I keep having people message me saying that, how can the Phantom enter his own faffle prizes? But um, uh, John Cookson, Terry Cray, Paul Maloney, Thomas uh, from Norway, uh, Gary Horn, Michael Rowe, Adam Williams, Sam Allen, and Joe uh, Elu, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, she's from your neck of the woods, uh, Dan. So thanks to all those people who have uh, donated or have brought a piece or have even won a piece as well. So uh, they're the ones that have brought tickets and, and won it as well. So a uh, huge shout out to those type of people. And we've got a little uh, little website on there, which has got the pieces and the running tally and everything as well. So uh, make sure you check our show notes and you go on there and have a look as well. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Thank you very much to all those people. Um, so moving right along, Inkspot this uh, this month. This is the uh, the comic that's or the, or the book, the magazine, that's put out by um, the Australian Comics Association. Have I got that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, I got a copy um, uh, thanks to a fan and fan who managed to get that one for me. Um, it's got a great cover by uh, Glenn Lumsden. Now, we've got an article on this on the web which has got the cover and the first page of the interview. Now, on our Patreon readers, you're going to have the whole interview, uh, but that's going to be when it gets updated next. So if you're a Patreon and you haven't been able to get a hold of this magazine, you will be able to um, uh, basically read the interview. And I've finished reading it. It's part one of, I think there's two parts. Uh, it's done by Dan, Daniel Best, who helped us with the Norm uh, Batman. Yeah, the Batman artist um, pieces that he did of the Phantom. So uh, he did a great interview with, um, with Glenn, and it turns out uh, one of his other artists, friends which was dave heinrich uh it's really interesting look some of it's been covered in our podcast with glenn lumsden previously um but look it, it's um it, it, it's worth it's worth reading so if you're a patreon user uh patreon supporter you will be able to go and read the full interview as well absolutely and um in the article that we put up german off Forgive me, I haven't uh, looked at it today. Um, there was there a link to contact the Comics Association to buy the magazine yourself as well? Because I've certainly, given that I knew it was a, a two-parter, um, I've I've ordered both parts and, and waiting for them both to come. So I haven't got my copy yet. I'm hoping that it comes with the second copy. Do we yeah, have the link there? Or? There is there is a way. I think there's the Facebook. Now, it's not it's not usually available for the public. This no. Magazine. So I don't think they're too worried if they sell them though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, contact them and you should be able to get a copy. But if you don't get a copy, it's probably because, you know, I don't, I don't believe it's printed in huge numbers as well. So yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so I really would recommend people, if they can, get a, get, a, get a read of that because Glenn Lumsden, I think, is, is a bigger name in comics than, than a lot of fandom fans realise um, and it gives you great insight into the rest of his career as well and what he's been involved in. Yeah. Sad, some sad news did come out of, uh, of Turkey um, over the last month and that's with the passing of um, pro prolific and very talented Kizil Mask artist, cover artist, Aslan Zakur. Um, just um, amazing the amount of pieces that he's produced over such a long period of time. Mm. He did it for, it was about 20 years, and he did over, I think it was about over 250 um, Phantom covers. And then while he was doing that, he also did Zagma, Mandrake, he... Um, uh, I think he did some interior work for James Bond stories. Um, I did some quick maths. And I think I worked it out with all of the covers. And this is just a guesstimate because even he doesn't know exactly how many covers he did. But he did about 250 uh, Phantom. He did a couple hundred Mandrakes, a couple hundred Zagma. And he did, you know, a lot of other covers and all that. He did basically two covers a week. For about 20 years. Well, 
it's fair to say, and, and this is not a criticism in any way, but they're very simple. They're very clean drawings. Yep. That's actually part of their charm. It's part of why I like his work so much is it is a really clean line. It's not overcomplicated. Um, not saying that that's easy to produce and you can just pump those out daily or whatever. Um, it's still an impressive uh, feat that you're talking about, but mm. perhaps part of the ease of it is it's not, it's not an overly complicated style that he's got. It's beautiful in its simplicity. Yeah, I've got a cover. I'm not sure you can see it there. Well, can't really see it there, but that's a cover um, that I've got of his. And then I've got a sketch cover, which is on the other side of the door as well. Um, I, I, he was a nice guy to talk to. Uh, he always had time for fans. Um, you're right in saying that the style is different. He, you know, back then in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, it wasn't so much about a quality. It was more about quantity. Um, and, you know, Fru was like that. The Germans with their Bastille was like that. Uh, you know, Phantom Man to a, to a certain extent was c- kind of like that as well. It was, yeah, qu- uh, quantity over quality. And um, look, they're great covers. I've got maybe, I think I've got about 30 of those comics in my collection. Um, I've got a couple signed by him. Really nice guy. Um, yeah, if, you know, uh, on our website, we've got an interview with him, um, which is really insightful and, and talks about how he was discovered and how he, you know, he was basically an artist in the markets drawing things for tourists and stuff and how he got uh, discovered and he got hired. So it's a great story. And uh, and our thoughts are obviously with his family and his loved ones who uh, are missing a a, a treasured family member, not just an artist as we are at this time. All right, um, some better news. Uh, we flick around. Now we, we look at Boss Fight Studios. Now, last time we had a comics and news uh, podcast, it's fair to say that, T, uh, Jim, you put Boss Fight Studios on the long tee, took a happy Gilmore run-up and let swing <laughs> driving a long way down. Uh, did come off the long run. Um, if, what's the latest on Boss Fight Studios? Well, it worked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, I got a hole in one. So for those who didn't listen to it or can't remember, um, basically last month, uh, some of us, and I believe Steve, you did as well, got an email saying, hey, if you want your pre-order, you got to pay extra. So <laughs> um, myself and Steve uh, both got our high horse up um, and she said no. That's not right. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, yes, we know situations change, but we've pre-ordered and basically what, the way we understand a pre-order is that you should um, keep your end of the deal. Uh, they've decided that they will honour that. Um, luckily, also, uh, Australia and the US had started um, uh, talking and sending parcels through to each other as well, which enabled them to be able to um, honour that deal without losing too much money. Um, so, yeah. So, look, I still haven't got mine. I've been told it's been sent and that all the Australian orders are being sent or have been sent, but I haven't received a tracking number. Um, it's fair to say, and I've, I've actually communicated with Eric on this, who's the owner of Boss Fights, and I've said, look, you know, I've and who has been this, on the podcast before? Who's been on the podcast? I've said, look, I've said this on the podcast. You know, I stand by what I've said. Um, it's it's a little bit hard to be able to want to buy the other stuff in pre-orders if I haven't got my first order done properly. Um, so hopefully, my order arrives soon. Um, what about but, you, know, Steve? Is yours is yours arrived? Have you received similar emails? I, I do remember seeing that email. I haven't really. I've been on. Well, I've been trying to be on hold as much as possible and yeah. not really been check my emails to tell you the truth. Um, but when Jim said that there was one saying that they've sorted out the the cost, they no longer have the extra cost. I did go check and yeah, I got that email. Yeah. Um, but 
Yeah, I haven't checked for tracking numbers or that they've posted them or anything like that. Yeah. Has anyone, I mean, Jeremy, you'd know as well as anyone, has anybody in Australia received theirs that you know of? We've seen Not, them online. Yeah. People in America in particular seem to be able to find them. but Yeah, so all American orders, uh, I believe, are the Canadian ones and I believe some European ones have been sent and arrived. Uh, Australia, I don't believe. Now, most parcels in Australia are taking four to five weeks from the US at the moment. Um, I should be getting one this week as well, which has taken about that long. Um, but I, you know, look, I'm assuming they probably did the US, Europe, and Canada probably first, and then they've probably done the Australian orders last. Um, so, look, hopefully we get it in the next week or two. Um, and, you know, we're blown away, and then it will re it will re-establish the faith that I used to have in them and then I can do a pre-order for what... Because I haven't ordered 1.5 or the other two um, designs yet. I've been waiting to get my Wave 1.0. Yeah, yeah. And so the the Hero um, figure, which is one that we've all, you know, expressed delight at the fact that there's going to be a horse figure available, I think it's fantastic, um, and the Phantom in a grey suit are both now available as, as pre-orders. Um, but you, you, as you've said, you, I, you're not doing that. I haven't done that. I haven't pre-ordered anything yet. Sort of watching to see how it all unfolds, and, and hoping I can pick up some uh, some of the ones that uh, appear as they actually are around. Um, and Steve, you, you haven't, you're not going to pre-order any of the other ones, a bit like Jerm, I suppose. Uh, yeah, same boat as Jerm at the moment. Um, I've, yeah, pre-ordered one point but I haven't pre-ordered anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm still, uh, I am still hopeful and I have great faith in my uh, local comic book guy, uh, the shop, the store owner there, Todd. He looks after me and I'm very confident that somehow he'll make magic happen there without me having to scrape the internet for him. So we'll see how we go. Um, anyway, the, the sooner those toys get in our hands, the better because we're all looking forward to them. Um, another thing that's coming up, um, speaking of toys in hands, reminds me of Christmas and it's a Phantom Christmas <laughs> is coming in June. Um, that's the annual for, for Australians anyway, Australian Christmas uh, in June for Phantom fans in Sydney at the annual Supernova and um, Lee Falk Memorial Bangala Explorers Club dinner. Um, coming up mid-June, we're getting excited for it, guys. It's, it's, we've called it like the Mecca moment. It's, it's kind of like for a lot of Phantom fans, it's probably the most, it's probably about the closest time they ever get religious um is is this weekend um look there's been a lot of chatter about it already um people are starting to get excited uh the venue has been announced for um uh for the dinner uh you know donations are starting to come in um there's been some scuttlebutt talk, uh, discussing guests and possible guests um mm. we're not going to go into that scuttlebutt um, until we have anything half concrete or we're being told that we're allowed to share it. Um, look, yeah, I'm, I'm now a 50-50 to be able to go, so my circumstances have changed. Uh, 50-50? The other day you were talking time. like you, you were 100% going the other day. Well, look, I'm trying <laughs> the last to... last podcast he was 100% not going. He yeah, really I know, did. but then the messages came through this past week and, <laughs> yeah. oh, geez, he's cashed in some, he's had some I, brownie points. <laughs> I did say I may be going, but... Um, Fair yeah, to say, so we, haven't, we haven't seen the tickets yet, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'm, until the flights are kind of booked and, you know, and stuff like that, I'm still... Yeah, I'm about a 50-50. Look, it'll be, it'll be nice to go. I haven't been for two years. Um, I really do enjoy the weekend. Enjoy catching up with a lot of guys uh, at Supernova, but also the dinner. Um, don't enjoy the late nights as much, and the you know the following week, and the reality when you come back to work and and stuff like that. But um, look, it's you know it, it is a great weekend. Um, so hopefully we get a hopefully we get a. I would like to see an international guest. Um, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, be, the, the rules around COVID in Australia have, have really changed. The, the international borders opened, have opened up considerably in the last week. We've got cruise ships coming into Sydney Harbour again, to I see today. So, <laughs> yeah, right. dikes, surely we can uh, – it would be wonderful to see someone from, uh, from yeah. overseas. Look, if, if someone asked me for my opinion, which 
it's not going to happen, and I'm sure supernovas... <laughs> they don't, they'd, they'd give it to you anyway. <laughs> when was the last time you needed to be asked, mate? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure supernovas well down the track and all that. I would like to see Sal Valuno, Graham Nolan, or maybe Alex Suviak. Someone along, along those lines, um, which have got a real... And I'm trying to think of names that have got a, a phantom appeal for the dinner and supernova, but also and not a, just a phantom appeal to be able to appeal to the non-phantom fans as well. Mm. Um, and, you know, like... All of those guys you've just mentioned have got good, solid fan bases in other, uh, yeah. let's face it, more popular uh, superheroes, all of whom have had movies about them, which helps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, the Phantom has, but it just was a lifetime more, ago. More recent. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So cell has got, you know, he's got the Black Panther. Um uh, you know, he, Alex is Spider Man, Spider Man, Batman as well. So, you know, there's some fairly big names now. You know, that's my top of the tree. You know, would you know, I would love to get and stuff like that. Mike Manley wouldn't be a bad one either. Um, okay. has Tony DePaul ever come out? No, I, I'm not. I wonder, I wonder if a writer has the same appeal as, a, as an artist. That's um, for Phantom fans. Yeah, well, just because you know, like there's, you know, like there's artwork to be sold and yeah, yeah. you know, and that type of I'm stuff. I'm not thinking but, about that. I'm just thinking about guests at the dinner. Yeah, yeah. I'm being selfish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, look, if I if I had to have, you know, like I said, if if my opinion mattered in this and I could cherry pick a couple of cool names, that would be some of ones that I would choose. Fair enough. And uh, look, it, no matter who it is, we know that it's going to be delightful because um, going back in the day, and, and certainly this predates me, I'm not sure if it predates you, Jim, but Phantom, the guests at the dinner didn't always have a great deal to do with the Phantom necessarily. Um, so they were just uh, local identities who could, or, 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 you know, celebrities, Australian celebrities who had fantastic stories to tell. And, and mm. every dinner that I've gone to, um, the guest speaker has been compelling um, because of their own personal journey, no matter no matter what it is. So um, I'm sure that uh, whilst um, whilst it might be good for well, not so good for um, bank balances and checkbooks, if uh, those big name artists come along, whoever's there and whatever story they tell um, is going to be absolutely worth listening to, and, and hopefully um, you know everybody enjoys it. Well, when we were there, Dan, you spent more time on the phone ringing up your bank, transferring money than you actually did your family. Um, and that's a true story. No uh, exaggeration at all. No, but I have, I've shuffled my finances since, so it's a lot easier. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you are right. That is, I'm not going to deny that. <laughs> and talking about finances, this is all for worthy calls. All the donations um, at the dinner, and anyway, the auctions and stuff. Yeah. Um, go to support the children's hospital, which no doubt have been hit hard over the last couple of years due to COVID. No doubt they've um, won't haven't got the donations that they they would usually. So um, it's fantastic that they're able to put the the dinner on again this year, and and hopefully people bring their their money bags and they've got their accounts in in line and can come and help support the the children's Absolutely. hospital. And, and it is worth saying that almost everybody. Oh, that, well, I don't know what the percentage is of. A large proportion of the people who attend actually donate something into the auctions as well. Mm. So uh, whatever, you know, extra phantom collectible or goodie or something that you might, um, if, if you're coming along to the dinner, you, you bring that along as well. Let them know ahead of time so they can go in the catalogue, silent auction. Um, and there's money raised from a wide range of donations in that way as well. So um, as you say, Steve, it's a it's a great, um, great foundation of charity to get behind and... Um, yeah, certainly the organisers, Richard and Antonio, who've been doing it for some three decades, two and a half decades now, have, um, have been doing a wonderful job. And if you'd like to to like to know more about the Lee Fork Memorial Bangala Explorers Club dinner um, and, and perhaps score your way onto the, uh, the email spam that comes around, um, and I say that with all due respect and love because I love it, um, but uh, there's a the website that uh, we've put together www.lmf sorry lfmbec makes sense. Leaf Memorial. There's a cursor <laughs> sitting right in the middle of it. 
<laughs> www.lfmbec.org um, and you can see um, photos and get information about past dinners including guests and all the rest of it and as I say if you want to um, start getting onto the email list about what's going on and where it is and all the rest of it um, just uh, contact us at chroniclechamber.com and we'll put you in touch with the organisers all right well that's um that's brought us to the end, I think, of a, of a bigger run sheet than I looked. <laughs> That's it. About, a, about an hour and a half. So, you know, with, with the last two podcasts, so the, the panel and then the chat with Duncan, that might be three podcasts under th- two hours. I don't think that's oh, ever happened before. All right. Well, thanks very much, guys. It's been really talk to really good to talk for Phantom with you again. Um, once again, if you you want to catch up with everything, most just about everything we talk about, we report on as well on the website chronicle chroniclechamber dot um, Email us uh, chroniclechamber at gmail dot com as well, and it's, uh, hit us up on any of the socials. We're on Facebook as I've mentioned earlier. We're on uh, Twitter at Chronicle Tweets. We're on Instagram Chronicle Chamber, um, and of course uh, on the YouTube, which we've mentioned a few times, and, and many of you may have watched us there. Um, subscribe, enjoy. Bye. Um, get the notifications whatever on whatever platform you're listening to us but most of all stay safe hope you've had a happy Easter and uh, until next time happy fandoming everybody happy fandoming stay safe happy fandoming justice and cruelty and all my sons will follow me so evil doers will believe that this man cannot die the man come the ghost who walks the man come enemies beware the phantom's always there But you won't find the phantom